very warm welcome to the Alt Block Art Lovers. I'm here in the Tate Britain members room um, enjoying a very lovely long tea which you can see here before heading into women in revolt art and activism in the uk 1970 to 1990 really intrigued for this show i don't know much about it i'm going in with an open mind and, uh, and an open heart so come and join me this show is on until the 7th of april it's 17 pounds to get in don't forget to subscribe to the art blog and hit that notification bell for loads more reviews of shows coming in london the southeast and the show is vast, so I've only included some selected highlights, and also I've, I've deliberately not included some of the more explicit work so that this can be accessible to all art lovers, but you'll have to go and see that for yourself. Rising with Fury takes us back to the start of the second wave of feminism, more than 50 years after the first wave had come together to gain the right to vote. The room presents powerful works which record and articulate the, the demands of the second wave liberation from a patriarchal society which treated women as second-class citizens and also that most fundamental basic right of equal pay. Much of the work on display here is activist art made for the streets as much as the gallery but no less powerful for it as women marched and protest did for what we today would consider basic rights. Some art lovers would have lived through and participated in these movements and if you did please do post in the comments because I'd love to see and hear what you thought about this exhibition and how it reflected the second wave. We were introduced to artistic collectives such as the Sea Red Women's Workshop who I, uh, whose work I particularly enjoyed and the Hackney Flashers and they form a strong cohesive thread through the exhibition. The Sea Red Women's Workshop, for example, appear right in the final room as well, as well as multiple times in between. There are lots of video works and documentary works, which together, if you watch them all, would take seven hours, and it's really worth sitting down and immersing yourself in some of these. Also, another feature is that many of the rooms have cabinets full of further documentary evidence, zines, magazines, posters, leaflets, which really bring the exhibition alive. The art also connects with multiple roles of women had to juggle, like bear it in mind, as well as the economic injustice, which you can see here, of unpaid housework. And, and there's also documentary evidence of powerful women-led strikes against discriminatory practices um, in factories and um, other work settings across the UK. The Marxist wife still does the housework and moves chronology to the late 1970s. De jure, much legal equality has been achieved, but de facto traditional gender roles remain. The Hackney Flashers, Who's Holding the Baby, highlights the struggle for decent affordable childcare for working women and the lack of support um, for this role from the state. While Helen Chadwick's performance piece, In the Kitchen, sees the artist wear a PVC skin stretched over metal frames to manipulate a feminine, traditionally feminine female place, um, Lorraine Leeson produces posters for GP surgeries, warning of medicine's fundamental patriarchal base. The second half of the room reminds us that um, feminist art in the second wave wasn't always polemical, like Susan Hiller documenting her pregnancy, or Rita McGurn's um, charming uh, fabric pieces, which were produced purely for private um, enjoyment and, and, and as a sort of private art created for herself. And there's also a nice link to the fifth room in the OWAD banner as well. The third room cro crosses the late 70s and early 80s and makes several interesting links between the punk movement and um, the second wave feminist art movement. First of all was the um, DIY nature of both movements as we often see through the works. But secondly, there was also the fact that both movements often employed multidisciplinary approaches like punk combining fashion with music and art. And thirdly, the exhibition points out that punk allowed identities to change and be challenged. 
Jill Posner's um, photographs of sexist, eye-wateringly sexist graffitied adverts are a highlight of the show, in my opinion. Um, uh, uh, some really interesting street art, whereas um, Susan Swales' hegemony um, decapitates the patriarchal, picture-perfect nature of Charles and Diana's wedding. Cozy Funny Tutti brings a more individualist um, perspective, saying, I align myself more with gay liberation than women's liberation. Freedom to be was my thing. I didn't want another set of rules imposed on me for having to be a feminist. Room 4 zooms on one specific place, Greenham Common in Berkshire. It reminds us that on the 5th of September 1981, a group of women marched from Cardiff to the Royal Air Force Base at Greenham Common, where uh, weapons, first strike weapons, were being stored um, by the US. And um, this peace camp grew over the 1980s to become a seminal place. The exhibition explains how the peace camp was both a tough place to live, but also a refuge in an all-women's space. And that the, 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 the women who protested at Greenham Common saw it as intrinsically feminist. Artworks inevitably came out of the Greenham Common movement, like Margaret Harrison's recreation of the Greenham Common fence, which replicated the fact that women tied articles of clothing, toys, etc. to the fence as part of their protest. Um, the the influence of, of the peace movement involves sculptures and songs and, and dancing as well as art that was that was that was put down. And the influence spread beyond Green and Common with this Sister Seven touring exhibition of posters um, spreading from its first exhibiting in Newbury, very near Green and Common, to over seventy venues worldwide. The biniggest protest saw a forty mile fourteen mile human chain embrace the base for peace, and it got lots and lots of media attention. The second wave feminist movement has often been accused of being concerned with white women's issues, but um the um Black British arts movement challenges this in a variety of aesthetic styles by confronting head on the racism which many um, black women in Britain um, suffered in the 1980s. We learn um, that in 1981, Bajan Hanjan and Chila Kumari Singh at Burman opened four, women, four Indian women artists, the first UK exhibition exclusively organised by and featuring women of colour. And after this exhibition, um, there was kind of like an explosion of different um, uh, representations and exhibitions of art by women of colour. And, and this is actually one of the strongest bits of the show in terms of the range which is on, on, on show. An absolutely seminal work is Marlene Smith's Good Housekeeping 3, originally shown in an exhibition called The Thin Black Line, created by Lavena Hamid at the ICA in 1985. This work reflects and remembers the shooting in a case of mistaken identity of innocent mother Cherry Gross and her paralysis from the shooting and eventual death. It took until 2014 for the Metropolitan Police to, to apologise for this mistake. And we also see the classic um, Shubha de Biswas's Housewives with State Knives, a seminal work of the um, Black British art movement, um, which which uh, which is really uh, looms up above you, kind of it deliberately tilts out from the um, from from the gallery walls. These artists had to face systematic institutional racism in the art world. As Biswath and Smith described in the exhibition, we have to work simultaneously on many different fronts. We must make our images organise exhibitions, be art critics, historians, administrators and speakers. We must be the watchdogs of the art establishments, bureaucracies, sitting as individuals on various panels as a means of ensuring that black people are not overlooked. The list is endless. They said this in 1988 as they struggled to get their work seen. The final room takes us to this period of high Thatcherism in the 1980s, the late 1980s, and is aptly called There's No Such Thing as Society. 
um, it was a much more individualistic age and some of the art actually um, engages with with um, lesbian relationships and it's really important the um, the exhibition points out that this was in the context of the incredibly repressive section 28 which outlawed the positive promotion of homosexual relationships within schools this was also the age of of, of the City of London and money and this infiltrated the art world as well the fetishization of money I suppose and some of the works refer back to that as well um, this is where the second wave of feminism begins to to break but what I feel really inspiring was that um, you know the gallery was full of of both uh, people who lived through the second wave feminists and also younger people who have maybe grown up in the third and fourth waves of feminism at the end of this so-called post-feminist period. Um, the energy is still were there in works like the Carrot piece by Labain Hamid, a strong piece, and incredibly personal pieces like this very moving Nancy Willis um, uh, piece, which, which was just touched me so much. I think it's really apt that one of the last pieces of the exhibition is Shirley Verhoeven's portfolio, because it leads towards this sort of period I remember from the 1990s of so-called post-feminism um, when the second wave became a bit kind of passe and the word feminism was a a bit of a dirty word but thank goodness that's no longer the case as the third and fourth waves have risen and the exhibition doesn't end in this room you have to go outside of the main Tate gallery to see the final piece a real treat of the exhibition is Bobby Baker's An Edible Family in a Mobile Home. It should be noticed that this is in the gardens of, of Tate Britain and is free, so you can go even if you don't have an exhibition ticket. And as you walk towards it, you're reminded that the original exhibition in the 1970s, or rather the original installation, was um, in Bobby Baker's prefab house, where she turned it for a week into a piece of installation art. Each room has um, is covered in newspapers from the time and this is an edible baby you're encouraged by the artist to eat various members of the family as part of the installation as you can see the baby itself was not um, particularly um, uh, uh, it been very much enjoyed I should say and um, I had a taste of the edible man who sat in his chair and I have to say he was absolutely delicious um, you're also offered a very small cup of tea by hostesses. Originally, Bobby Baker um, was a hostess, and she dressed up in a um, pin in, in an overall. And she said, "For the first time, I decided to dispense with the problem of deciding what to wear. I would always adopt a more neutral garb in the form of a women's overall. I liked the fact it was neutral and yet deeply complex in the ways it could be read. Also, it was my conscious." female riposte to Joseph Boy's macho fishing waistcoat and hat. Um, even the walls are covered, as you can see here, in icing, which I had to really restrain myself from licking. This is a tremendously fun um, installation and a real treat to have it restored. As far as I'm aware, it's coming to Manchester in 2025. I'll definitely hopefully be there to experience it again. Well, art lovers, I hope you enjoyed that look there at Women in Revolt here at from Tate Britain. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the exhibition. Um, I thought it was as much about social art history as it was about a pure art show. But the amount of art that was um, that was on show and the diversity means that I could only really just scratch the surface. Um, inevitably, with a show like this, there is um, a huge range in the quality of the art. But as a as a social history and, and the, uh, with the narrative, it was incredibly powerful. And we have to remember that lots of these works of art have never been shown in galleries before. And so, um, it, you, and so they, we might call some of them great art, some of them folk art, some of them activist art. And um, and it's brilliant that they've all been brought together. And it must have been a huge curatorial effort to do this. So hats off to the Tate Britain curators. I thought that the narrative approach, which which explored the different preoccupations of the feminist movement at different stages worked incredibly well um, from basic equal pay in the first room through to more nuanced understanding of, of sexuality and the emergence of, of the lesbian um, art movement in the 1980s. 
committees, especially in response to Section 28, was a really powerful moment indeed. And I thought that that story makes this show unmissable. If you're interested in the, femi- in, in the, in the history of feminism and the art that was produced, because so much of the collectives and individual artists I, that, are, that were there, I was unaware of. The Sea Red Women's um, co- Collective, for example, or the Hackney Flashers, I didn't know, and there was so much of their work consistently spaced out um, across the show. Um, there were obviously some very well-known uh, names that I've that I've covered on the blog before, like Shepard Abyss was with Housewives of State Knives, and a couple of good works as well by Lebena Hamid. But uh, for me, it was about the discovery of artists I didn't know anything about, and um, it was just so powerful. And it actually came, you know, it, 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 you come out feeling what I came out feeling, both invigorated and angry, angry that it took such consistent pressure to even achieve what we consider today basic equality but also um, also inspired by the consistent and persistent activism the green and common room for example reminded us that that women sacrifice sometimes years of their lives in very harsh conditions for a cause they believed in so this show is about an activist art movement um, which you will learn a huge amount about and you'll see some great arts and funny arts and very very angry art um, and you will learn a huge amount the documentation was so dense I've already been twice this is the second time I've been and I will definitely be going again and, and again the video work by the way it, on its own is about seven hours worth so obviously I did not see all of that and the um and then you know the documentation means I would probably if you're not going to sit through every bit of video which you probably won't I would give yourself about three hours to see this um I think the 17 pounds is outstandingly good value for what is such a dense and um well curated show love the narrative learn so much we'll be back again um It's on until April, so you've got quite a long time. Don't forget to subscribe to the art vlog, hit that notification bell, and most importantly of all, get out there and explore the incredibly rich UK art scene.